Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. morning. (laughs) My name's Christopher, and I'm part of the team here. It is wonderful to see so many of you here at St. Mary's this morning. And if you're joining us online, a very, very warm welcome to you, too. Without further ado, let us stand and sing our hearts out to the Lord our God. Please stand.
Yes, Lord, to you alone we owe the highest praise. For you alone can rescue. Amen. Please do take your seats. So this morning we're going to be looking at the parable of the sower. And to help introduce that, we're going to watch a video from the Stories of the Bible series. So let's look to the screens as the video starts. Playing. Stories of the Bible. The parable of the farmer. This is Jesus. hey Who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love. He healed many people from their sickness, performed many miracles like calming storms, and even raised people from the dead. One day, Jesus went and sat beside the sea. A great crowd gathered around him. Oh, hey, everyone. So he got in a boat and told them many things in parables. Okay, listen to this. He told them this story. A farmer went out to plant some seed. As he scattered it across his field, some of the seed fell on a footpath where it was stepped on and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil among rocks. The seed began to grow quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plant soon wilted under the hot sun, and since it didn't have deep roots, it died. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still, other seed fell on fertile soil, this seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as had been planted. When Jesus had said this, he called out, Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Hey, Jesus! Yeah? Later, the disciples came to Jesus and asked what this parable meant. Jesus said, The farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message, only to have Satan come at once and take it away. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are treated badly for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the desire for other things. And the seed that fell on good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even a hundred times as much as had been planted. So we're about to sing uh, some more to the Lord our God. And in the next two songs, which will be uh, Water You Turn Into Wine, and uh, all for Jesus. The children are going to go to their groups. So let's please stand and sing. The words will appear on the screen.
Yes, thank you, Father, that it's only in you, in your Son, that life makes sense. We think it's only when we're following you that we fulfill the purposes you call us to. Lord, may we indeed seek to live for you with each passing day. Lord, may we seek to reach out to be your living presence wherever you uh, place us. Lord, help us to be your living presence, your hands, your feet, your eyes, your ears, your mouthpiece, if necessary, in this world. Lord, lead us, we pray, this day and every day in your great ways and plans for us. In your name we pray. Amen. As we continue in a time of prayer, do please be seated. Sorry. Not yet. You're too early. <laughs> Sarah. All right. No, 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 no. I was talking to Sarah saying the youth have gone out. Yes, they have. That's what I meant. Sorry, Sarah. My sign language failed miserably this morning, friends. Apologies for the youth have now left. But we continue now in a time of confession as we reflect on our lives. We know God achieves his amazing plans through each of us. Why? Because he loves each one of us. And that is his plan and his great delight. There is no plan B. But we know we don't always live life the way we're called. But God is our greatest encourager. He is the one who seeks to restore us. And friends, there's no number of strikes before you're out with God. It's just the true and penitent heart. The heart that comes and says to him, Lord, I'm sorry. So let's spend a moment reflecting on our lives, on the good, but also that which we need to ask our Heavenly Father's forgiveness. Then please respond in the words in yellow in the confession on the screens. Let's spend a moment in silence. Loving God, we confess to you our lack of care for the world you have given us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We confess to you our selfishness in not sharing the earth's bounty fairly. Christ, have mercy. We confess to you our failure to protect resources for others. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May God, who loved the world so much that he sent his Saviour to be our Saviour, his Son to be our Saviour, forgive us our sins and make us holy to serve him in the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. And everyone said, Amen. 
Well, at this point now, it's time for our intercessions, and Brian is going to lead us this morning. Thank you, Brian. Our Father and God, we praise you once again that we come into the presence of Almighty God, the great Creator. Forgive us, Lord, if we ever come into your presence and, as it were, bring you down to our level and talk to you as though we're talking to the man next door. Help us always to come into your presence with awe and reverence, knowing you are the great God. But we praise you, Lord, that even though you, you are the great God, we have the privilege, if we know you and take you into our hearts, we have the privilege of calling you Father. And we thank you and praise you that we can come into you with all our problems, large and small, no matter what they may be, we can bring them to you. And as we bring them to you, Lord, we can learn to trust in you, to trust that you are at work in our lives, to trust that you are at work in, in the world, in all its problems and difficulties, Lord, we know that the world is in a terrible state at the moment. Conflicts and problems all over the world and many things happening which we call natural disasters. And yet, Lord, we know that you're in control. We praise you and thank you that your world tells us you do nothing to harm us, only to bless us. And just like many of us with our children, we've had to punish them, but we punish them in love because we want the best for them. And we thank you and praise you that with the things that are happening in the world and around us, you are dealing with us in love because you want to bless us. Lord, as we read Amos, we read of many things that have happened to your people and yet after each calamity as it were it is stated but yet you would not return to me and we realise Lord that we your people have a responsibility we have a sp responsibility of spreading the word we saw it in that video sowing the seed wherever we are whatever we're doing sowing the seed of the gospel message. Because as it says in your word elsewhere, how can they hear if nobody tells them? So how can our neighbours, our friends, know about Jesus Christ if we do not tell them? Lord, forgive us for being lax. Lord, your word also tells us, if my people who are called by my my name will humble themselves and pray. I will come to them and I will heal their land. Lord, does our land need healing? Does our world need healing? And yet, Lord, it can come down on the responsibility of your children that we're not speaking out. We're not humbling ourselves. We ourselves are going up along the road of sin perhaps without realising it, but we need to humble ourselves and then you will heal the land. Mighty God, we praise you and thank you that you hear our cry. You heard David's cry in the Psalms when he cried out, how long, Lord, how long? How long will the evil seem to dominate and cause problems? How long? We allow the world to spit in your face, Lord, to basically say to you, you can't do anything to us. We're in control of our own lives. How long? But again, as David says, way back in the times of Jacob, you restored your people. And then he says, restore us again, O Lord. Restore us again. Restore your people. Restore your church. Let us rise up, 
regardless of the consequences, and speak the truth in the name of Jesus. And Lord, come in the name of Jesus and heal our land, Lord. Heal us as individuals. We're all guilty. I'm guilty of all these things. But we need to humble ourselves and seek your forgiveness. Lord, bless us. Bless your word today that comes to us. Speak to our hearts and minds. Speak to the one who will bring us your message as we pray for the world at this time. That as men and women are gathered around your word, we pray that you'll bless them in their worship. May it not be a worship of the head only, but worship that comes from the heart, truly giving all to you. Lord, bless our land. Heal our land. Restore us, O Lord, and glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so please join with, us, with me in the church's special prayer for de- today, which is found on the screens in yellow. Almighty God, send down upon your church the riches of your spirit. It doesn't look as if we've got any more of the special prayer for today. Can you advance to the Lord's Prayer? Thanks. Oh, we do have it. Oh. Oh. Now we do. So as our as Saviour taught us, so we, we pray. pray. Our, our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed be your name. name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. heaven. Give us today our daily bread. bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Brian and Julie. Sometimes computers don't work the way they are, but we're very grateful for our AV operators. In fact, can we give a round of applause for the way they serve, because we are much appreciated. (laughs) Guys, we acknowledge that you must be really getting nervous or dying in your shoes when it doesn't quite come, but thank you for faithfully serving us in this way, especially when computers don't do what they should. But now Francis is going to bring us our reading, after which Judy will be back to share God's word. Thank you, Francis. Our Gospel reading this morning is from Luke chapter 8. The parable of the sower can be found on page 1036 in the New Testament. The parable of the sower. After this, Jesus travelled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's, Herod's household. Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. While a large crowd was gathering, and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, He told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop, a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, The kingdom of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that... 
Though seeing, they may not see. Though hearing, they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way they are choked by life's worries, riches and pleasures, and do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be back here, up here. I mean, it's not like I haven't been here for the last few months. I have. But it's lovely to be back up here. I haven't preached for a while, and some of you may have wondered why. It's just because the last year has been horrendous work-wise. But it's in a better place now, and I said that I would preach this morning. So I hope that's all right. But before I do, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time this morning. I thank you for each person who is present in this building and each person who is listening online or who will listen later in the week online. Lord, we ask that the words that I speak might be your words. And Lord, that we will have ears that hear and understand and eyes that see and that see. So Lord Jesus, now we ask that you would be with us through this time in your name. Amen. Right, well, I love a good story. And many of you here this morning know that I love reading, so it's just as well I love a good story because, hey, I'd be in trouble, wouldn't I? And some of you might identify with that. Others, perhaps not so much. Perhaps you're not particularly into reading. But it's likely, even if that's the case, that each of you has a favourite story, whether that's a story you first heard when you were a child or a story you've heard or read since you were an adult. Now, those who write stories, of course, whether for a child or an adult, will have carefully crafted that story. And we know that there are some extremely gifted storytellers, either from history, and I can think of, say, Jane Austen or Charles Dickens or Thomas Hardy, or current writers of stories like C.J. Sansom or Alexander McCall Smith. You can tell I'm kind of giving you my favourites here, aren't I? (laughs) Um, But today, we begin a series through the summer that goes on till the end of August, thinking about stories that Jesus told, and he was the master at uh, telling stories. And one of the most well-known things that Jesus did was tell stories, parables, that taught his listeners about the kingdom of God and what it meant to be part of God's family. Now, these parables are of varying lengths. Sometimes they only last a few verses in our Bible. So the parable of the growing seed, for example, in Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 29, is clearly only four verses long. But others are much longer. But regardless of length, Jesus' most characteristic way of teaching was through parables. And today's parable, the parable of the sower, is possibly among the most well-known parables Jesus told, probably only surpassed by the Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son, both of which actually are only found in Luke's Gospel. Now, our reading today of the parable of the sower has been taken from Luke, but this parable is actually found in Matthew and Mark. And you can see Mark's version in Mark chapter 4, Matthew's version in Matthew chapter 13. And although there are slight differences in the way each Gospel writer reports the parable, The fundamentals are the same. It's like telling a story to a child, a fairy story to a child. Each, Well, I'm not saying every one of you here has done that, but I'm sure many of you have done that. Each of us will have told the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears in a slightly different way. But the basics of the story remain the same. So it's a bit like that with our accounts of the three accounts of the parable of the sower. The fundamentals are the same, but the way each gospel writer kind of frames that story is slightly different. So today we're looking at Luke's account of that parable. 
And our account of fit the parable of the sower here is set in the context we're, inform we're informed about in chapter 8, verse 1, the first verse that Francis read to us, where we're told that Jesus is traveling around the towns and villages of Galilee, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. And then verses 2 and 3 report who are with him and those who are helping to support Jesus' ministry. And then in verse 4 we read, while a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town. So you could have skipped out verses 2 to 3. We could have said to, to Francis, don't read 2 to 3, just read verse 1 and then through to verse 4, because that sets the context in other words, this parable is in the context of Jesus proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God to the crowds. And the theme of this parable and its context actually continues after the, the parable ends, after our reading ended this morning, into verses 16 to 21 of the same chapter. Because the theme of our parable and all the verses around it are about response to Jesus' preaching. Now, I suspect that many of us know this parable well. A sower goes out to sow seed, which falls on different types of ground or soil, and as a consequence, has different degrees of success in bearing fruit. In fact, of course, the only seed that bears lasting fruit is that which falls on the good soil. And Jesus explains this parable at the request of the disciples in verse 9. It tells us that, which is actually quite unusual in accounts of the parables, because Jesus rarely explains, like the Queen, never complain, never explain. Well, Jesus rarely explains his parables, usually because the audience gets the point all too well. Think Good Samaritan. He got the point. But in this case, Jesus does explain the parable. And to reinforce the point I've just made, that this parable is part of Jesus' teaching about response to his teaching... There's a small interlude between the telling of the parable and its explanation, where Jesus talks about seeing with eyes that see and hearing with ears that hear and understand. And he quotes from Isaiah chapter 6. And we'll come to that in a moment. So let's begin at the beginning. The picture that Jesus creates in his story would have been familiar to his audience. A sower sowing seed, tossing the seed into roads. The sower goes out to sow his seed, it's not just seed generally, it's not the seed, but his seed. And the word scattering suggests, as one commentator says, a joyous abandon in sowing where the sower is not careful, in sowing where the sower isn't actually careful about where he sows his seed because he knows the harvest he reaps will be extravagant. So you can kind of get this picture of someone going, woo, 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 never mind. In the scattering of his seed, it lands on four types of soil, the path, the rocky, the thorny, and the good soil. The seed that falls on the path doesn't even get a chance to sprout. It gets trampled on and eaten by the birds. That which falls on the rocky soil begins to show signs of sprouting, but due to lack of moisture, fails to develop further. The next type of soil, described as being thorny, appears to deliver growth. But the thorns overwhelm that growth. And finally, the seed falls on soil, which brings not only growth, but extravagant, abundant growth, producing a crop that's a hundred times that which was sown. Now, the typical yield for seed sown in Palestine was around seven to 15 fold. So this yield is truly abundant. But while it might not be typical, it's not impossible. In Genesis chapter 26, verse 12, we're told that Isaac planted crops and reaped a hundredfold. Why? Because the Lord blessed Isaac. And at the conclusion of this parable, Jesus calls out to the crowd, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. There follows a short interlude caused by the disciples asking him what the parable means. And with no suggestion in the story, actually, that the crowd has disappeared, because the crowd is mentioned again in verse 19, not that they've come back onto the story, but they're still around, Jesus says that the disciples have been given insight into the secrets of the kingdom of God. Now, when you see the word disciples, very frequently we just think 12 disciples. We just think of the 12 disciples. Actually, in, in the Gospels, disciples is a much broader term. It is the 12, of course. But it's a much broader term. Those that followed him, those names that were read out in verses 2 to 3, 
They were disciples. So those, the disciples, those who follow Jesus and listen to him, are given the secrets of the kingdom of God. They're given insight into that. But others, those who don't, Jesus says, he speaks in parables in order that though seeing, they may not see, though hearing, they may not understand, which, as I said, is a direct quote from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9. What on earth is going on here? In Jesus' ministries, there were, in Jesus' ministry, there were two responses to him. Those who heard Jesus preaching, witnessed his ministry, believed in him, and followed him, including but not restricted to the 12 disciples. And remember, many of those who would have believed in Jesus and followed him wouldn't have actually followed him around. They would have gone back to their homes. They had to lead their lives. But they heard his ministry, they witnessed his ministry, they believed in him and they followed him. But those, there were another group of people who heard and witnessed exactly the same, but who hardened their hearts. And despite what they saw and heard, refused to acknowledge who Jesus was and who was among them. And it's important to realise that both groups of people heard exactly the same teaching. They experienced exactly the same ministry of Jesus, his miracles and so on. But those who received Jesus' teaching grew in their understanding. They grew in insight of what God was doing in and through Jesus. But in contrast, by contrast, those who hardened their hearts saw but didn't see heard but didn't understand and Isaiah prophesied about these because seeing is not necessarily believing hearing is not necessarily to understand you need eyes that see and ears that hear and understand and in doing that you're given insights into the secrets of the what is the kingdom of God what is Jesus doing he's building his kingdom he is the king who has come and you're given insights you might not fully understand but you're given insights, you're led and grow in understanding. If you close your eyes, close your ears, you're not going to see or hear anything, even though you seem to be hearing and seeing. So seeing is not necessarily believing. Hearing is not necessarily to understand. So there's these two responses to Jesus' preaching. And then Jesus picks up the parable again at verse 11 as he explains it. And note that the sower disappears from the explanation. In fact, he's only mentioned once in the entire parable. And the focus is entirely on the seed, its destination and outcome. And without any possibility of misunderstanding, Jesus is clear. The seed is the word of God. And with that preamble, the four types of soil and resulting outcome are explained. Now remember, all hear, all hear and receive the same word or seed. But people along the path hear the word, but that word is snatched away from them and bears no fruit, not even minimal growth, because they refuse the message. The devil snatches it away and the seed has no opportunity to flourish. In the second and third soils, there is growth. In the case of the rocky soil, the seed starts well and these people receive the message with joy, but growth is short-lived as despite appearances, there's no root And the message sown and its fruit cannot survive the testing times. In the case of the seed sown in the thorny soil, as one commentator describes it, there's arrested development. As the growth of the seed becomes choked by the concerns of daily life. And the encouraging signs of growth and development don't actually come to maturity. And finally, there's the seed that falls on soil that is good and is described as those with a noble and good heart, as these people hear the word, retain that word, and persevere with it, leading to fruitfulness. It's not the case that the hearers on the good soil welcome and receive the word, because the seed on the rocky and thorny soil has been welcomed and received. The contrast is with the fact that those with a noble and good heart, the good soil, retain that word. They persevere with it. It's that which makes the difference. And that's great. And on one level, given Jesus' explanation, it could be argued there's nothing more to say. But hey, you've guessed it, I've got more to say. (laughs) 
First, it's important to realise that the fruitfulness of the seed on the good soil would not have happened overnight. No growth in a garden anywhere happens overnight. It might be self-evident, but it's worth mentioning. It requires, for the fruitfulness of the seed in this parable to grow, it requires retention and perseverance. Fruit takes time to develop. Just as it would take time for weeds to choke the growth on the thorny soil, or for the lack of root on the plants on the rocky soil, to become obvious. So time is required for good and abundant fruit to develop. Fruitfulness is the result of a process. It doesn't just happen. It needs to be retained and persevered with. Second, I think it's also self-evident that the different responses to the word sown that Jesus talks about in this parable are still applicable today. That continuum of response to the preaching of his word from reject, utter rejection to fruitfulness and everything in between the sowing, that response of the, to the sowing of the seed is still seen today. The seed hasn't changed, the variety of responses hasn't changed, but what has changed is the identity of the sower. In the case of this parable, of course, the sower is Jesus who preaches and ministers to the crowd. And while there's a sense that he is still the sower, he now works through his followers. The seed must be sown, scattered, if you like, with that joyous abandon I spoke about earlier, knowing, like the sower in the parable, that while some seed will bear no fruit, there will be seed that will be abundantly fruitful. Third, I think it's important to recognise that while Satan is one who seeks to prevent growth from occurring, he's only one of the problems that prevents people from bearing fruit. Two of the soils refer to our response to the message and the impact that life's circumstances have on allowing that growth to occur. All of us as followers of Jesus will experience testing times. I'm sorry, but it's true, you will. And let's face it, the particular circumstances of life at present, with the cost of living increases, cost of fuel and cost of energy, certainly provide ample food for life's worries. Each soil, rocky or thorny, has not gone away. So what's the remedy to ensure that we are fruitful, that we are those with a noble and good heart? We need to be those people who retain God's word, Persevere with it, even in those testing times, even in the midst of the concerns of daily life. And let's face it, they are real. We are burying our heads in our sands if we think, oh, well, we're Christians and we're, not, and we're immune from it. We are not. Those concerns are real. So we need to retain God's words, persevere with it, so that we can be those people who hear and cling to God's word with a noble and good heart through all life's challenges. Fourth, the focus in this parable is not the sower. As I said, he's only mentioned once, and, that's, and he's never mentioned in the explanation. Even, it's not even on the seed. The focus is not even on the seed, because the seed is the same throughout the parable. The focus is on the different types of soil. And I want to suggest, and I can assure you I'm not original in this, that this parable is not correctly named. And that rather than call this the parable of the sower... It should be called the parable of the soils. Four different soils are spoken about. The question is, which soil are you? As you hear the word sown, is your heart a path? Is your heart rocky? Is your heart thorny? Or is your heart noble and good? If you like, that's what one, one person I read describes as the one moment response, that moment when you hear the word. And that's a good question, and it's an appropriate question to ask, what kind of soil are you? But that might be too easy, because we just think, well, I'm one moment, I've accepted it, fine. Particularly because you're in church this morning, or listening online, the probability is that we'd all want to say that our hearts are that good soil in which the seed has taken root and bearing fruit. But perhaps, as the same commentator suggests, the question is much more comprehensive. And we need to ask ourselves a much harder question. As you look at your spiritual walk up to today, 
Which soil are you? If fruitfulness takes time, we need to realise that response to God's word is not simply a one-off moment, but a lifetime of responding, as the fruit that grows from that word takes time to develop. A plant doesn't sprout overnight, neither does the harvest of the heart. As Jesus said to the crowd, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. We're all responsible before God as to how we respond to his word. Are you someone who sees, hears and responds to the message of Jesus with a noble and good heart? Is that fruitfulness developing? And it takes time, so don't kind of beat yourself up if it's not kind of like the most abundantly flourishing. It takes time to develop. But have you got that noble and good heart where that fruitfulness is taking place and growing? My prayer is that this parable of the soils helps us examine our hearts so that each of us might be people who are good soil, who've got a noble and good heart, where the seed flourishes, where it bears fruit a hundred times and more, that which is sown. As you look at your spiritual walk up to today, which soil are you? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this well-known parable. And Lord, I pray that each of us will examine our hearts this morning, that we would be people with noble and good hearts who allow you to allow your seed, your word, to develop, to grow, to bear fruit in our lives, fruitfulness that just comes from you. So it help us to be people who retain and persevere with your word. We ask this in your name. Amen. As musicians come back, let's just spend a moment in silence as we reflect on where we're at. Are we living fruitful lives? Are we in a season of bearing great fruit? As Julie said, it is a journey. It is a lifetime. There are different seasons. Where are we at? Let's spend a moment in silence just reflecting on that. One of the tools that can help us, and it is one of many tools, is being part of a life group, part of a small group, that gives the opportunity to share life together and to go deeper into God's word. To share life together. Life group stands for living in faith encounters. Because our God is a God who wants to transform our lives, to see us grow into his likeness, through the many different and changing seasons of life. But through all, if we let him, God's hand does guide us, his church, from age to age. And that's what we're going to sing about now in our concluding song, which is also our offertory song this morning. Your hand, O God, has guided your church from age to age. The tale of love is written. For us on every page, what will our response be today? If able, would you please stand as we sing this hymn of praise?
loving God, that thank you that you call all of us to be your amazing church. Lord, help us to grow in fruitfulness all the days of our lives and take now these gifts which we give back to you, that more people would come to know you as the amazing God you are. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you please be seated, everyone, before we come to our closing prayer. First, some life news again. Life 24-7, living in faith encounters that remind us of what's going on. Thank you for joining us this morning, especially if you've joined us online. Do please say hi. I try and get back during the week to say hi to you too. But it's great that you can join us. Here at church, we're revising our church directory at the moment, which hasn't been done since 2019. Over on the side in church, by the sofa corner, is a printed out. If you find your name is not on there, and looking around, I can see a number of you whose names are not on that. Please fill in one of the forms also by there, so that we can have your details added to that, and that way we can get you into the system. Furthermore, we can then update all the entries and then roll out Church Suite, which is the app uh, version of our church directory that we can use on mobile phones. So do please make sure you check that and tick your entry. At the moment, we're going through a refurbishment program of refurbishing the church hall. And there are various changes that were made. Thank you to Dan for a day's work yesterday. Dan, you did a great job. It's still standing up. It hasn't fallen apart. So that's always a good sign. But coming up on Saturday the 6th of August, we need help painting the church hall. So if you think you could wield a paintbrush for an hour or two or whatever, please do come. Refreshments will be provided. We do commend that to you. As part of sharing life together and encouraging each other, we have afternoon teas coming up starting next week uh, at the British Place, which is on Sunday afternoon, 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock. The card with all the information that you can take away is in the church porch. Please do take that away. Of course, due to extreme temperatures these next few days, some things are changing. And I learned before the service, Cafe on the Green has cancelled but did you know that this is in direct opposition to recommendations that has been made? If you read the news reports, where are they saying you should go to in extreme heat? Churches. You should be coming into churches. But I think the idea is to shelter from the cold and not the, you know, heat. But, you know, do pray for people, especially this week. We have a funeral in church on Tuesday. Do pray, especially for all the movement at this time. But a reminder, Cafe on the Green, which normally takes place in the church hall, will not be taking place on Monday. Thank you for being very gracious about the rugby school, friends. None of you have taken the opportunity to uh, rub that in. But didn't England do well? England can beat Australia any day in my box. Apologies if you're an Australian. We do really love you as Kiwis, but there. Final notice, coming up, of course, we have our holiday club. And there's a need for some craft preparation that you can do in the comfort of your own home. Please see Liz after today's service. So some holiday club preparation. If you're able to help, we would be delighted. Well, friends, as we come to the conclusion of this time, for those present, as we engage in refreshments, let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for bringing us all together today. We thank you for those here in the church building. We thank you for all those who have joined us online. Lord, remind us that you are the God who desires to sow his word in our lives. Lord, a word that sustains us, that changes us, that brings much fruit in our lives. Lord, show us the path to great fruitfulness in our lives this day and every day. And Lord, may your blessing remain on each of us. May we know your living presence in and around us all the days of our lives. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, friends, thank you for joining us today. Do please go and enjoy the rest of the week. Look after yourselves. Keep calm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, musicians. <laughs>